Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the GM Ecotec 1.4 Turbo and how it works. Now this engine is most commonly found in the Chevy Cruze but also in the Chevy Sonic and Buick Encore. Now these engines are known to be a bit problematic especially to do with the cooling system. So we're going to tear this one down to see just what happened and why these engines fail. Yeah check out all that coolant coming out of there. It's not supposed to be so thin and now it's turned black like oil. But taking a look at the construction of the engine here we do have a plastic valve cover then we have an aluminum alloy head, a steel block which is interesting to see in an economy car and then an aluminum oil pan at the bottom. Now the turbocharger is going to sit up at the front here. This is a transversely mounted engine and the intake side is on the back. Now coming around the back here you'll see this is the intake port. The intake plenum would sit on here and those were known to be a little problematic. We do have one giant coil on the top here that powers all four cylinders which will be a little bit more expensive to replace an individual. And at the top here we've got an integrated PCV diaphragm which are also known to fail and the reason why these valve covers get replaced so often. Looks like they're pulling a BMW here. My favorite socket set for this teardown is going to be the e-torques. Looks like we're missing the cam bolts over here and the valve cover's been off already. That's the oil dipstick. I guess the handle broke off. Also looks like the plastic valve cover's already cracked. You can see this is a doorman unit made in China. These probably fail so often that it was worth it for manufacturers to make aftermarket ones. Looks like we got some missing timing components. The cam bolts are not in there, which means that these are completely loose. Now you do have dual variable valve timing on both the exhaust and the intake side. I think there was also supposed to be a guide over here. Next I'm going to turn my attention to the cooling system. Now these plastic thermostat housings are known to leak and crack. You see it's got a bypass hose here that leads to the oil cooler over here, which is next to the oil filter. I'm going to go ahead and remove this from the water pump spout. Oh, it just fell off by itself. This is the original parts by GM. Next I'm going to remove the water pump, which again is another sore spot on these engines. They are known to fail after a certain mileage. Bunch of E10s. And pry this off. So unless this pump was replaced before, there was actually no gasket behind here. It just used a red kind of RTV. I also noticed this washer behind here is a little loose. What's interesting to see is that it's using a metal propeller. A lot of vehicles nowadays use plastic propellers, so that's good to see. This pump does say GM on it, so it might as well be the original. Next I'll get the belt tensioner off. It's interesting they're still using a long spring in here. Kind of old school. I already knocked the crank bolt loose. We'll just spin that off. We'll pop that off. So it's got a hexagon kind of shape to it. I'm just going to remove this bracket here for the AC compressor. All right, next up I'm going to work on this timing cover. A couple of bolts have already been removed, so I'm going to remove the rest of them. They're E10. Yeah, I hate it when it's down below here. All right, hopefully I've got all the bolts out. Let's see if I can pry this timing cover off. Now taking a look at the timing system on this Ecotec engine, it's pretty straightforward. You've got your dual cams up at the top there and at the top there and the chain goes directly from cam to crankshaft with two timing slides. Now this timing slide here is completely failed and this engine has a lot of carnage inside so let's take a look. Alright looking at some of this carnage here you can see that this timing chain slide is completely snapped off and there's bits of it back there. There's also this pin or bolt here that's just chilling over here. You can see just the carnage of this thing. All of those pieces are coming off. Furthermore, the slide that's supposed to be on here, where the chain slips against, is actually slid down all the way down into the oil pan. Now speaking of the oil pan, just taking a peep inside of there, I can see a lot of debris, a lot of carnage. Even in there, there's probably chunks of piston inside of there, and I can see a connecting rod that's damaged. This is going to be a fun teardown. I haven't torn down a carnage engine in a little while. So it appears that that pin was probably the timing chain tensioner. There's usually supposed to be a pin inside of here that's spring loaded and that would push this timing chain tensioner against the chain. Uh, that's not available at the moment. Please leave a message after the tone. Tone. Okay, I'm just going to pull off these timing chain slides here. That's what's left of this timing chain slide. Pull off that slide. This is the backing part. I don't know why they keep making these out of plastic. This is the actual friction part that slid down. And I'll just pull off this chain. At least this didn't get damaged. So this used to be the tensioner. Yep, yeah, it looks like it's a hydraulic tensioner. I can see a hole inside of here with this oil galley that feeds it. All right, next up I'm going to remove these cam caps. Yeah, some of these have a bit of lines on them, indicating that it is worn through from all that coolant that ran through the system. It's interesting that GM stamps all of their little parts, even these little cam caps, with their logo. I don't really see other manufacturers going down to that level. I'm going to pop off these camshafts. 
Now you'll see at the back here, those two slots are for when you're doing a timing job on one of these, which is inevitable because it's a GM, and you put the cam holding tool in between there so that they don't roll back. Now in this engine, the camshaft acts on these little rollers over here, which in turn are then going to push down on the valves down over here and the valve springs. Now behind that we have this little hydraulic piston thing, which is actually pressurized, and that's going to sit inside of here and push up against the camshaft to take away any lash. That way you don't have to do any valve adjustment. Well, someone's definitely been here before because all the head bolts are already loose and now I'm gonna remove the head well that's one rusty gasket the timing chain has its own gasket over here and then we have the head gasket now head gasket failure is all too common on these engines especially if another cooling component goes kind of causing the engine to overheat. In this case, you can see there's a bit of failure in this head gasket region over here, which allowed some of that coolant from the cooling jacket to enter the combustion chamber. Now, if there's a lot of coolant in there and the piston tries to compress liquid, well, liquid is non-compressible and it's just gonna explode the engine. Taking a look inside this engine, you can see the piston number one has completely left the chat. It actually made a giant hole inside of the cylinder over here, but luckily because this engine is made of iron, it didn't allow the piston to exit and hit something else that's more critical, such as the driver's face or any of the passengers. Pistons number two, three, and four are still working nine to five and are available if you want to contact them. Yeah, that hole looks pretty bad and the piston has completely left the chest. Now the bottom of the head did not fare any better. You can see there's one valve completely missing and the rest of the head looks like it's been mashed up pretty bad. Moving on now, the oil filter uses a cartridge style design, which I don't really like. I'll go ahead and remove it, if it'll break free. Yeah, stupid plastic housing, screw that. Next up, I'm gonna remove this oil filter housing. Sometimes it needs some encouragement. So you can see that the oil filter and the cooler are all one assembly. Basically you got coolant coming in and going out there exchanging its warmth with the oil over here which also has inlet and outlet. Now I'm going to rotate this engine slightly. Next I'm going to remove all the e-torques that hold the oil pan on. Now this is a stupid design. They've recessed the oil pan so tight I can't even get my socket to get those off. And even a regular 10 millimeter socket can't even fit in there. Turns out an 8 millimeter socket will also take out those E10s. Oil pan off. Yeah, check out the contents of this oil pan. You can see it's just completely obliterated. This is likely the piston. This here is the timing chain guide. And it looks like that valve we were missing from the head made its way down to the oil pan somehow. But if you take all these pieces and put it back together, I'm sure you can make a piston. Check that out. That looks like an oil control ring, the corrugated kind of ring. Taking a look at the bottom of the engine here, you can see we've got this baffle. That's meant to collect all the oil. Speaking of the oil, it does look very sticky. It's not very oily like a normal engine would be. Now these are all E10s. Pop this cover off. I'm actually quite surprised this thing didn't get damaged that much. Just a little bit of damage on piston number two and a lot more damage on piston number one, but it didn't completely deform. It kind of did its job to contain most of the mess. I'm surprised I didn't notice before, but there's actually a nice square inspection window where the piston came out of the block or at least it tried to. That's a piece of a piston head. That's where the wrist pin would sit. Now this engine by design kind of uses a pretty strong bottom end. It is a turbocharged engine and it does have an iron block, but moreover it has this ladder frame like design where this upper oil pan piece, which is bolted to the block itself, incorporates the main bearing caps, but is also bolted to the block. So it's kind of like one piece holding the crankshaft together. So that means that while your crankshaft might be safe, in this case it is, the rest of the block and the piston <laughs> is probably gonna blow. Now this design is great for those people who have like a Chevy Sonic nice light car and they want to tune their engine to make like 250 horsepower not so much so for the pistons though surprisingly their connecting rods are actually pretty tiny and they're only held on by two E10 Let's see what these bearings look like yeah unfortunately the connecting rod bearings also fared quite some damage I think the coolant was run through the system for a little too long okay, I'm gonna push the piston out of here it's piston number two I'm gonna remove piston number four yeah, connecting rod bearings are the same. And this one's the failed one. It was already loose. Okay, peel this bearing off here. Yeah, so this is the bearing off of the piston number one there. You can see it's flattened around the edges and around the edges here. So connecting rod number one actually fared okay. I mean, it's not obliterated or any pieces or anything like that. It is bent though. You can see there's a slight bend to it when you compare it to number two. Now taking a look at the piston tops, or at least what's left of it, you can see the rest of the engine was in a little rough shape. The oil control rings are kind of clogged up, which means the engine was probably burning a little bit of oil. Not surprised if they actually ran the engine a little low on oil. You can see most of the 
stuff just is full of that mud, which is the oil and coolant mixing together. Now the connecting rods at least, they feel like they've actually got quite a bit of weight to them, which is probably why this one didn't obliterate itself. Wrist pins are also known to be very strong compared to the rest of the engine. Now this is only a 1.4 liter engine, that's why the piston tops themselves are actually pretty small and look kind of cute. The GM's using some really tiny fasteners for the main caps and the connecting rods. These are once again an E10. This is like equivalent to an 8 millimeter bolt. Now also securing the upper oil pan to the block are these little E8 bolts. Okay, so I'm just going to take the engine off the stand and we'll take it apart on the ground. Wish me luck. It's an iron block. Ah! Alright, I'm going to try to break this lower part free from the upper part. Now after a lot of struggling, I could not get this thing to come off. No matter how much, I, how much I'm trying, I can't get this. Ow! Ow. Now that we've got this engine mostly taken apart, we're going to take a quick look at how it works. Now we're going to start at the bottom of the engine here where we have the aluminum oil pan. Now the oil pickup tube is actually integrated into the bottom of the oil pan, drawing oil from right at the bottom here. Kind of sucks though that we can't really see the screen or if there is any to see if any of these particles have made it inside of there to clog the oil pump. Next up we come to the timing chain cover. You'll see that the oil pump is integrated into the timing chain cover and it's going to draw that oil in here create fluid flow with the rotation of this crankshaft and then send it out to the engine block. Another thing to note is we've got the chain running around here and we've got coolant passages that pass through the block and the head over here. Next up we've got the engine block. You'll see that oil flow is going to enter the engine block over here and be sent down this oil gallery all the way to the other side of the block here where we have the oil cooler and oil filter assembly sitting over here. Now the oil filter and cooler assembly is going to take that oil, cool it off first, then send it to the oil filter so it gets nice and filtered out. The clean oil is then going to be sent straight into the block through this port over here. Now oil from there is then going to be sent to a gallery that runs along the length of the block and if you look closely you can see that there's actually a little pipe thing there and that's the oil sprayer that's going to line the cylinder walls with oil to hopefully lubricate that piston except for this one and here's a closer look at the carnage inside of the cylinder that failed you can see it pretty much punched a hole right through the water jacket over there it also punched a pretty big exit hole at the front here there used to be a bracket that held the ac compressor and that's what's kind of hiding this little hole here as you can see it punched a pretty good size hole and you can actually see directly inside of the engine. That's pretty impressive for being an iron block. Now also with the iron block you'll see that they use a semi-closed block design which again is going to lend for good strength because you've got all this material in between the cylinder and the housing over here. However, not so good for cooling. Also at the top of the head here you can see this is the oil feed that's going to go to the head so that you can feed the variable valve timing gears and lubricate everything up top. Looking under the cylinder head here you can see obviously we've got complete carnage on cylinder number one. It's completely messed up here very rough we've lost a valve we lost the spark plug you really don't want your engine to come to this point here where it completely explodes because you can't really save any parts after at least if it warps a little bit you can replace the head but if you do find that you're starting to overheat pull off to the side of the road and call your big brother oh yeah cracked cylinder heads are also a big issue on these engines so if you are going to be doing some engine work make sure make sure you clean everything off and have them inspected for any cracks I can actually see one right here. Now finally at the front of the head here you'll see that we've got the oil feed that comes in here. It's going to come up here and then go across, tap up and feed the two cam gears for the variable valve timing. It's also going to feed these two ports here which run galleries running along the length of the head. So the oil is going to run along the head here so that it can build up pressure for your collapsible hydraulic lifters but also these cam gears need to feed off of that so they can get lubricated as well. Now there are other problems with these engines such as the positive crankcase ventilation system, the turbocharger that sits over here, especially the wastegate likes to go, and anything to do with the cooling system such as these plastic components, elbows, water pumps, thermostats, you name it, it always goes in these cars. Now this valve cover has already been replaced likely due to the positive crankcase ventilation diaphragm inside of here. Let's see if I can use my pliers here and chop this open. And that's the cover. And this is the diaphragm that always likes to go. You can see it's made of rubber. And of course there's a spring inside of there. And this is all integrated inside of this plastic cover. Which means that you got to replace the entire thing when it fails. And that's a look at the 1.4 turbocharged Ecotec engine from GM. Make sure you check your oil and your coolant frequently if you don't want something like this to happen to you. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.